Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of One Room Schoolhouse. Today we are highlighting someone who may be the reason that Hawaii actually joined the United States of America, became part of the union, and certainly was one of the reasons that Christianity spread to an influence to Hawaii. We're talking about Betsy Stockton, who is recognized as really the first female to successfully go on as a missionary by herself at a time when that really wasn't allowed by the missions board in America at the time. But she's someone who broke a lot of ground and someone who really should be celebrated and honored for so many of her contributions throughout many places in the United States. So let's unfold and learn some of her story. Danielle, walk us through this. Right, so she was born in Robert Stockton's house. So that's how she got the last name Stockton. So when his daughter, Elizabeth, was married, she married Reverend Ashbel Green. And uh, so, Robert Stockton gave Betsy Stockton to Elizabeth as a wedding present. So Asheville Green, he was a very noted patriot. He served on the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, he was actually became the president of Princeton. And when he became the president of Princeton, Betsy went to go live with his nephew, Nathaniel Todd. Now, the reason for this is because, as you can imagine, she grew up with Elizabeth. So I'm sure that their relationship was very, um, they were the same age basically, right? When Ashbel Green became the president of Princeton, they now have to have a different standard for how their house was represented. So she went to go live with Nathaniel Todd um, to have a more formal and serious character about her. And so she lived there for three years. And when she came back to the Green household, she was baptized in the Christian faith and they freed her, but she continued to live with this family because she loved them so much. Mm -hmm. And she expressed to them that she really had a heart for missionary work. So they worked with her in order for her to become a missionary, which was no small task at that time. It's worth noting, to become a missionary back then, also to become a pastor back then, you had to have a pretty high level of education. Right. And it was something that also living in the home of the Reverend Ashbel Green, he had a library where they did a lot of theological study and actually encouraged her, like, hey, you should go read study, helped tutor and mentor her along the way. She had access to his entire private library, but she also had access to the students that went to Princeton uh, University who taught her seminary school. So that was huge. So she had a huge education in language, Bible theology, everything that takes to become a missionary. And I think this also harkens back to what was the purpose of these schools when they were first created, right? Princeton, Columbia University, Harvard, they all started as universities that were made to develop preachers and ministers and pastors. And so just the fact that uh, her master at that time was the president of Princeton and was able to download a lot, a lot of that information and give that to her, served her throughout all of those years. And I think that's a forgotten history of our higher education. And it also goes to show, right, even back then, because Princeton is in New Jersey. They're one of the northern states that by 1804, they had, with every single other northern state, collectively by 1804, all the northern states had passed laws to abolish slavery. Princeton was one of those universities that, as you're mentioning, she had been a slave, but then she was free. And not only is she free, she, she's living with the, the family that she had been the slave of, but she's learning this theology. But now at Princeton, She's welcomed by those mm -hmm. at Princeton. So not only is this a place that people are being trained in the ministry of the gospel, it's also a place that has a different view of the nature of equality, of mm -hmm. this idea the Founding Fathers outlined in the Declaration that all men are created equal. She's embraced by that. And as you mentioned, she really has a heart for mission. She, she wants to share the gospel with more people. But it's also worth noting, even as we talk about missions, that back then, the, the, the idea of being a missionary was not simply to tell people that Jesus loves you, which is so often what we think about with ministry today, right? We, we want to reach the lost. Jesus loves you. Or maybe in the Super Bowl, we just say, he gets us. Well, <laughs> right? He, he might get us, but, but there's much more to understanding Jesus or theology, the depraved, sinful human nature, that, that we're imperfect beings and there's a perfect God. And, and, and the only way we can be reconciled is through Jesus and his sacrifice, but there's discipleship that happens. And her heart wasn't just to tell people that Jesus loved them. She wanted to disciple them. So she didn't just want to go tell people about Jesus. She wanted to start schools 
to teach, to train, to educate, to raise them up like mm-hmm. she had been raised up when initially she didn't have the formal education, but now she's got a great education. She's been mentored. She's been trained. But the dilemma is, in order to be a missionary at that time, the requirement was that the missions board, they would only send married couples, which mm-hmm. actually makes sense on mm-hmm. some levels that you are now have somebody you're working hand in hand with and there's some accountability, there, there's safety and security. Mm-hmm. And so she wants to go as a single woman. Well, that's just not what they do. So she's going to have to get a lot of help along the way to be approved to go as a single woman. And she does ultimately get that approval, but it's through many letters that are written on her behalf saying that she is fully able and credible to go over there based on her achievement academically and her heart as a Christian woman. So she actually um, gets introduced to the couple Charles and Harriet Stewart. And they take her on as a third, if you will. And so it it becomes really great because they have a baby and she's there to help them with that. And then they get started up in the education world. So it's it's great. And and this is where they end up, she she ends up getting approved. And again, as you mentioned, partly because they recognize she's not going entirely by herself. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a family unit she can connect to. So... it's not quite like sending her by herself, but she's the first one to go that's not married to get the approval. So she's the first single woman to be approved to do this. So it is a big deal. What is worth noting, and I kind of teased this at the beginning, is the family goes to Hawaii. Mm-hmm. And- a five-month journey to get there. <laughs> now, I've been to Hawaii, and it was a couple-hour plane ride. Five months! Also, we should note that back then it wasn't called Hawaii. It was called the Sandwich Islands. It's true. It sounds delicious. Nice. I'm ready. Uh, lunchtime. Uh, I'm already thinking what sandwich there could be. But yeah, it's it's super interesting. The sandwich islands, and as as for many islands, when you look at the natives of these different locations anywhere around the world, so often they would have their own belief system and belief structure. And not unusual for most places of the world, there was even a level of hierarchy that if, right, if you're the king, if you're the prince, if you're the princess, you are way up here. And then you have your serfs and your peasants and everybody else below. And oftentimes in that era, it was only those that had a high position that would receive an education. So she shows up and she says, everybody should be able to to benefit from education and especially from Christianity and this discipleship and knowing Jesus and God and the Bible and these principles. And she begins this education system in Hawaii, which ultimately lays a foundation for the influence of Christianity in Hawaii, which kind of the end of the story is you, you do have the royalty of Hawaii that end up accepting Jesus, changes the culture of Hawaii, but she lays the foundation early on in these schools. Something that's really pertinent to mention is the fact that She started that voyage in 1823, took five months to get to Hawaii, right? And in a year and a half, 1825, had already educated 8,000 Hawaiians in the faith of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's absolutely incredible in such a short duration, being able to minister to and educate that many people. She later went on to start schools in Philadelphia and in Canada and numerous other cities. And when officials from those localities and from those states would go to inspect her schools and to look at the quality of her education, they said it was unlike any other schools that they had the pleasure of inspecting. That's such high praise. And what's, what's also kind of a little weird in the story, uh, I mean, sad for her, but it just feels like ironic, is the reason she left Hawaii was because the climate was bad for her health. She was getting more sick being there, and they said, hey, you would really do better to go back to the normal, right, population So she goes center. to Canada for her health? I, right, like, th- this is what's crazy. Like, I'm thinking if I need help with my health, I'm going to Hawaii, for right? Sure. Like, this, it's just so crazy. But yeah, so she goes to Canada. She goes several places. Everywhere she goes, she starts schools. Everywhere, as you alluded to, everywhere she starts a school, it was critiqued as being the best educational institution there was. And we're talking about someone who had been a slave, who really was like private tutor, homeschool kind of taught, Mm -hmm. obviously connected with students at Princeton, had some friends, but, but not really a formal education, just poured into herself and what she had taught herself and then what she began doing, exporting into those that were in her schools was considered the most beneficial, the most significant that anybody was doing at that time. 
This is genuinely amazing what she was able to accomplish. Absolutely. And I think also her pouring into that biblical faith of everyone. It was noted that in Maui, the, the characters of um, these people who she educated had changed so much that drunkenness was down, gambling was down, infant killings were down, infant sacrificings, which you will never be able to watch Moana the same way again after <laughs> knowing this. So it, it just, it's spreading the gospel and mm -hmm. she is a true missionary and she, as a single woman, I would like for ladies to look less at Beyonce and more at Betsy Stockton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love it. So on her tombstone, I want to read you part of what is on her tombstone. It says, of African blood and born in slavery, she became fitted by education and divine grace for a life of great usefulness. For many years, she was a valued missionary and afterwards till her death, a popular and able principal of public schools in Philadelphia and Princeton, honored and beloved by a large circle of Christian friends. We have talked often throughout this series of One Room School House videos about how these people were so influential in their time and era and what they did. But I would even argue again that the reason Hawaii changed culturally, embraced Christianity, became part of the union was because of part of the foundation that Betsy Stockton laid with these schools helping change the culture by introducing people to Jesus and seeing the shift in the lives of those there. An amazing person to look to, certainly someone that we ought to know more about. So for more information, go to wallbuilders.com. You can find out more about Betsy Stockton. And as always, if you want to find out more about some of these American heroes, tune into the next episode of One Room Schoolhouse.